What happens with the interpretation, because uh, what I do is mind-body culture, and, and, in, and in mind you can include spirit, and the culture will shape you into the reality that you're living out. You don't come into the world in a vacuum and you don't develop in a vacuum. You develop in a culture, and the culture will then dictate how long you live, what's middle age, uh, how to treat an illness. Here, uh, migraine is vascular, but in, in England it's uh, gastrointestinal, and in France it's uh, uh, the uh, liver. In France, everything's liver. Mal de faux. You have a headache, liver. In, uh, in Germany, you have a problem, uh, it's uh, heart insufficiency. In their mind, as you get older, you, you have heart insufficiency, and that's a given. So they give you medication for heart insufficiency. If you have an EKG in, in, in Germany, the probability of being abnormal is much higher than here. It's not placebo, it's just that we have a bioinformational field that when something breaks, everything else breaks in different levels, and the medical culture will dictate where to go in to fix, and everything gets better at the same time. Because you have a belief system, but you also have a biology that you're working with. And placebo is just um, a permission for an authority to give you permission to heal yourself. That's what placebo is, permission to heal yourself. But if you have placebo without cultural support, it doesn't last. So if you say, I'm a wonderful person, I'm a wonderful person, it'll last for a few minutes and the culture will beat you up and you'll go back to... So placebo doesn't last without cultural support. You have to have subculture. So you, the, the whole point of this is to know how powerful your culture is so you can break away from it and create subcultures. Because as Carolyn says, when you, when you leave the tribe, you will pay a price. But if you stay in the tribe, you'll pay a bigger price. Uh, so you have to be ready to be abolished and be banished. You have to be ready for that. And, and you have to do it uh, on the path of the mystic. Because if you do it linearly, it doesn't work. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't work very well. So as you move along with the, with the path of chaos, then when you go into shock, or when you go into from linear to not linear, what will happen is you bring out your old scripts into the interpretation of shock. And the way that I look at, at in biocognition, I, I, I see three archetypal wounds that we have. They're, 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 they're culturally spinned, but they're archetypal because they, they cross cultures. I think that we can only be wounded in three ways, with shame, abandonment, or betrayal. And each culture will, will shame you or, or abandon you in different ways, but the abandonment is there. And the psychoneurological process that goes on with, with abandonment is there. So when we have these wounds, then we tend to impose them on the shock uh, event. So if you go from linear to nonlinear and you have an abandonment um, wound, you will make the interpretation as, as an abandonment one way or another, more subtle than others, but abandonment would be the, the spin that you give it, or betrayal would be the spin. If somebody's not meeting, if somebody meeting you for lunch at a certain time and they're late, abandonment will come out and say, well, just uh, this person, just here I am, I'm feeling, you know, all of that will go on, and you'll make the interpretations based on that. That's the bad news. The good news is that once you learn what your wound is, or wounds, then you know that you're going to impose that and that it's not the real world that's going on out there, but it's your psychological space that is, that's interpreting the world. And you'll know then how to deal with it, because they're, they're, each wound has a healing field, that I call it. And abandonment has a healing field of commitment. Uh, shame has a healing field of honor. And betrayal has a healing field of loyalty. And sometimes I'm, I'm really uptight about trying to remember them all, because if I don't remember one, they'll say, ah, so you have that wound. You're, you're, you're suppressing. Why did you forget betrayal? You know, so what I do is randomly forget one so I can give everybody a chance to, <laughs> to psychoanalyze me. Um, so uh, mine is betrayal, by the way, so I, mine, I forget betrayal a lot. So once you know that, then and at the latter part of, of this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some techniques actually to really deal with, with, the, with the wounds and how to actually create the healing fields that, that enhance... Um, your, your biology, but also resolve the, the, the wounds. Uh, because the wounds happen very early in life, and they happen and interpret it at the age, at the develop, developmental stage that you're in. Uh, children ha cannot abstract very well till they're seven. So if it happened before seven, it'll be a very concrete interpretation of abandonment. 
But the sad thing about it is that once you have a wound and you learn the wound early, your heart is young, your mind is very concrete, you will find ways to replicate the situations that wound you. It's like what Carolyn talks about woundology. You become really good at woundology. So I'm not suggesting that we're coming into the world with wounds as, as, as victims, but we're coming into the world with wounds as, as, as wounded heroes uh, that, that are wanting to learn from the wounds. So if you know what yours is and you begin to, and, and there's some methods that I can, I can show you how to go back and look, then you'll know that you're going to be superimposing that, but also the victim always hurts back. So if you're wounded with shame, you're going to be shaming others and you're going to be speaking shame fluently or, or betrayal or, or abandonment, or whatever it is. And each of the wounds, they're all based on fear. You have fear, pain, but then in the abandonment you have fear, pain, and isolation. In the shame you have fear, pain, and embarrassment. In the betrayal you have fear, pain, and anger. Because you notice when someone betrays you, you get angry. When somebody shames you, you feel that sense of you're being overwhelmed of, 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 of the shaming process that goes on, the, the embarrassment that goes on. And sometimes when people are shamed, they turn red. That's, that's the histamines. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, they, they all have fear because, uh, you know, disciples of pain at first that I'll explain in a minute. You have, with abandonment, you have fear. You have pain, emotional or physical. And then you add to the fear and the pain you add the embarrassment. I, I'm sorry, to, to, sh to the uh, shaming. To the shaming. Very good. Shame is pain, fear, and the embarrassment. That's a shame. What? Oh, yeah, that, good idea. Why don't you do that? Yeah, because these are, these are really vital for what I'm talking about here. Disciples of pain. There, there are three levels of learning. And the children learn the first, what I call disciple of pain. Children learn because they, at first they have a very uh, uh, self-centered, uh, there's no ego. And the ego is, is, is body. And, and when a child is a few weeks old, they can't differentiate between the, the blanket and themselves. So they'll bite the blanket and then they'll bite themselves and say, oh, this, there's a sensation here, there's no sensation here. And gra gradually they begin to create the image of self. <clears throat> but that's how they learn. They go, oh, there's a chair. I can't go through the chair. Unfortunately, some of us stay in the disciple of pain and you can only learn through pain. You only have, you wait for the wall to hit you before you stop. And there, there are three, two other levels, but anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, uh, let's see if I can write this. Uh, shame, they, they all have fear. pain and embarrassment. Then you have abandonment. And it also has the fear, the pain, and isolation. And then betrayal. Notice how I made this one, the last one, without even thinking? Very good. Okay, so betrayal has the, the fear, has the pain, and it has the anger. So you begin to see now that if yours is, is prevalent, what kind of emotion are you going to be functioning with? Embarrassment, isolation, and anger. And that becomes the prevalent emotion that, that you spin the world with. <clears throat> so, as you begin to identify these things, you also find that, that since you speak the language, you will look for people that you can actually speak the language with, so they can do it to you or you could do it to them. But what it does is it creates a sense of helplessness. No matter what I do, I just keep finding the, right, the wrong people, and just over and over, relationship. Uh, you should never get out of a relationship till you resolve that you're okay with it and then let it go. Because if you don't, you'll spin and take the, the scripts with you. Uh, <clears throat> so, when you learn these things, 
Let me give you an example on the abstraction of the child. Um, I mentioned that last night or yesterday. If a child is shown a ball that's half red and half blue, and uh, I like to say a four-year-old or five-year-old, they, they're learning colors, and if it's red here, you say, okay, this is red. What, what color is this? Red. What color is this? Blue. Red, blue, and they learn it. And then you say, red. What's behind the red? Red. They can't jump out. They can't abstract and go out. And that is a very, very important process because if you don't learn it at the higher level, you don't learn empathy because empathy is getting out of yourself as the other person rather than you as you. So the narcissistic will say, I am getting out of myself to see you as me. They never get out of themselves. So it's a projection rather than empathy. Empathy is actually getting out of yourself to see the other person as the other person in order to feel what, what, they're, what, what you could imagine they're feeling. But not, that's why with, with adolescence, if you say, well, how, how would you feel if I did that to you? Just, I don't care. Because adolescents cannot really go into empathy for very long. Uh, and now there's some uh, latest studies that are showing that, that um, frontal lobe development sometimes goes up to 20, 21 or 22. So you have to wait 21 or 22 before they think that you're okay, your kids. Because they're, they're, you know, there are only three kinds of stressors. Uh, external stressors, internal stressors, and adolescence. Because <laughs> my, my daughter always tells me, why do people pay you for your lectures if I get them for free? You know, it's just a <laughs> so you don't fight them because they have more energy and more concreteness than you. 